Hi again, everyone. Thanks for coming to another Authors at Google event. Today, we're very pleased to welcome Alan Black to the San Francisco office. Alan hails from Glasgow, where he started writing on sidewalks with chalk. A bartender by trade, he co-founded the Scottish Cultural and Arts Foundation in 1995. In 1996, he produced the American premiere of the hit stage play version of Trainspotting. His involvement with the Scottish literary renaissance in the 90s allowed him to introduce an American audience to many of the new writers emerging as part of that influential wave. He has worked with major US publishers in promoting writers at the Edinburgh Castle Pub in San Francisco. And in 1999, he was around for the formation of the annual Litquake Festival, and he sits on the executive committee of Litquake. In 2006, more recently, he also founded the Swearing Festival. So Alan's going to be reading from his book, Kick the Balls. And he'll be open for questions uh, about possibly the book itself, about the Swearing Festival, or any of his, uh, of his activities in San Francisco. So please help me in welcoming Alan Black. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah? All right, cool. I'm glad. Thanks very much, Nick, for uh, inviting me down here today. And thanks so much for coming out during your lunch hour. That's great. Thank you. And thanks to Google for doing this. It's pretty cool. They're, uh, they're, they're doing this for writers, so that's great. So thank you all. I'm glad you mentioned the swearing festival. That means I can swear. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the things. I did a reading the other night, and there was a, it was a, there was a kid there with his dad, you know. And I was like feverishly trying to find passages that wouldn't, you know, make him think, hey, what's wrong with that guy? <laughs> but anyway, um, I guess uh, a little bit of background about the story and the book. I, uh, I moved to the States in 1989 and I lived in San Francisco for a long time and had apartment life and listened to the guy in the next apartment flushing his toilet and the neighbor upstairs chopping lines of cocaine at 6 a.m. <laughs> And then finally I grew up and got married and had two children and moved to the suburbs over here in uh, Albany in the East Bay. So that's where I, I live. So we were lucky enough to buy a house out there and before the prices went crazy and I discovered that I had a lawn in the front of my house and most of the other neighbors also seemed to have lawns. But being from Scotland, lawns were the last thing on my head, or watering lawns was the last thing in my head, because in Scotland, that's all you do is just uh, take the rainwater off your, your face and hair 24 hours a day. So I didn't think about it, and pretty soon my lawn started to die. And some of the neighbors started commenting on it. In fact, I was taking out the trash one Thursday morning and the trash guy said to me, hey man, you've killed that lawn. <laughs> and suddenly I felt I'd been convicted of some sort of crime against <laughs> the suburbs or something. And I started thinking, hey, you know, how? I need to start thinking about where I am now and what I'm doing and how I'm going to fit in here, you know, into this new life that I've got. So the lawn sort of became my first uh, struggle with this change in my identity. So another time as my, my son got bigger, I decided that it was time for him to play soccer like a lot of kids do at that age and what parents do, take them to the soccer field. And it reignited my passion for the game that had been in a hiatus since I'd come to the States in 1999. 1989 I had started following baseball and football and I knew the infield fly rule and I could follow and talk about you know, whether this was going to be a change up and all these American sports things. So soccer kind of drifted away from my consciousness. But when my son started playing again and I made the, the big mistake of uh, deciding to coach the team, uh, it reignited all these passions that were within me that had been suppressed for a while and a lot of them were rather strange and not very pleasant. So <laughs> I uh, took out some of that on the worst soccer team in the history of the game. <laughs> and they were only made worse by me. <laughs> so anyway, I thought I'd read a little bit about um, my lawn and then a trip to San Diego I made as a contrast to what was happening here in the Bay Area. My in-laws are from San Diego, so I go down there quite a lot. I know the city quite well. And the name of... Uh, the team that I was coaching was the Dragons. So anyway, this is about the, uh, the lawn. 
Later, the sun baked the earth. I stood staring at my homestead lawn, the stamp of suburban man. My lawn was seriously ill. It had a fever. Scabby lesions were breaking out across its surface and weed tumours were munching away at the heart of the green. I touched it. It was sticky and icky like the carpet in a by-the-hour motel. How the fuck had this happened? It was fine and dandy until I started coaching the dragons. Across the street, my neighbour with a jarhead haircut sneered at me. His triumvirate of gas guzzler, small boat and virile lawn complemented the large American flag flying from his porch. Every day he watered. Hired hands gave his lawn a regular military trim and his laryngitic dog pooped on my ruined patch, passing judgment. <laughs> the trash collector told me, you've killed that lawn. A friend sympathized. You poor sod, you poor sod, he said, <laughs> as he let a handful of lawn ashes fall through his fingers. It was lawn murder in the first degree. In my mind's eye, I saw the lawn ranger come galloping down my street where he proceeded to hang me from a lamp post. I thought of the dragons. Their rot had spread to my grass, but I was determined not to surrender. I pledged there and then that my lawn and my team would recover. It would be the greatest comeback since Lazarus. From Home Depot, I'd get seed fertilizer and weed killer. I'd subscribe to Lawn and Leisure magazine and turn this dying scab of earth into a fertile oasis, a symbol of my American success. So midway through the season, uh, there was a break and we went to San Diego for a little holiday. So this is San Diego. The place was teeming with bumper stickers proclaiming that everybody's boss was a Jewish carpenter. I saw one rebel vehicle that asked, can I have your car after the rapture? It was hot, it was dusty, and the lawns were perfect green. I had a chat with my mother-in-law's neighbor Hi, I said with a smile. He looked scared, as if he had never met another human being. Yes. Uh, I'm visiting from uh, Northern California and I'm having a spot of bother with my lawn. Uh, how do you keep it so green? Are you a foreigner? No, 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 I'm an American. You don't sound American. Well, I'm Scottish. I'm Scottish and I'm an American. Scottish? Yeah. Like Mel Gibson. <laughs> you know, Braveheart, The Passion of the Christ. Oh, yeah. Well, how do you keep the lawn green? Sprinkler system on a timer. I got it off Rainbird. Rainbird? World leader, irrigation systems. Wow, and it works. What about seed? Seed? Yeah, seed. Oh no, I don't know anything about that. You said Northern California? Are you from San Francisco? Around there. A lot of weirdos up there. <laughs> Put my arm on my hip. Yes, sir, weirdos everywhere. <laughs> that did the trick. He was gone. The next day, I pulled onto a San Diego freeway past a dated Christmas billboard that read, Jesus is the reason for the season. And there I was, mistakenly thinking it was Macy's. The freeway lanes were wide enough to handle the ever-increasing waistline of the American truck. I drove the rental car to a park, listening to Limbaugh on the radio, 
wondering what it felt like to drive high on hillbilly heroin. <laughs> the biggest ass vehicles I had ever seen were bursting over the white belts of the car park spaces. A man in a giant throbbing Hummer was vibrating as he blasted modern country through his music system. And if you listened closely enough, you could just make out the sound of a frozen ice shelf shaking and drips falling off it, somewhere up near the North Pole. Kids and their parents were swarming over the lot like a rash, and soon soccer was being played all over. What a contrast to the fields the dragons were playing on, 600 miles to the north. These fields were obviously maintained by squads of excellent gardeners, clipping the stalks to perfect heights. There was not a large hole to be found, no rut to twist the ankle in, the perfection unspoiled by no scabby earthweed popping up like beastly acne on a pauper's pitted skin. This turf was as sharp as a Camp Pendleton haircut. And there they were, the white San Diegan version of suburban parents. They had the cotton dockers on, Advanced dermatology was keeping the cancer at bay. Blonde ponytails popped out above the adjustable strap of baseball caps, some blessed with messages from God. Kibs were hopping around with Jesus as my homeboy t-shirts crucified to their bodies. These people would drive over you in their family wagons if you even thought about doing harm to this paradise. I took two extra strength aspirin to kill the throbbing headache Limbo had given me. I was glad that I'd packed the stain defenders from Dockers and the golf shirt as I stepped out of the car into the glare. My hairy Scottish ass was sweaty. <laughs> it was too hot out here. I looked into the distance and saw a man-made lake stocked with fish. And on it, I could see a little boat floating. And if I stood in the sun much longer, I would see the mirage of a white man with a beard, long hair and sandals, dumping fish into the lake, preparing to host the feeding of the 5,000. <laughs> so San Diego and short haircuts and thinking about things that lie on top of your head. One of my childhood traumas was getting a haircut. And it is something that has always stuck with me. So this is the story, the tragic story of my local barber in my hometown in Glasgow when I was a kid. His name was Desi Divers the barber of Glasgow, a tragic operator. Back in the 70s, Desi Diver's barber shop was up a small stairway in an old brick building on our main street. He shared the premises with a hair salon for women. Salons were segregated back then. And to get to his section, Men were forced to pass by rows of ladies' heads humming inside conical hair dryers. I always thought it looked like aliens had landed. And once you reached the men's section, you are surely in a different world. You knew that your barber would keep your secrets to himself. Dandruff, psoriasis and scabs and then maybe money troubles, girls you fancied, whether or not you were a Catholic or a Protestant. He was like your doctor. Sadly, in Desi Diver's case, he was Dr. Mengele. <laughs> Desi's corner had two large barber chairs facing the mirrors. Broken music crackled from an old radio, too low to make out. Big black combs floated in super blue disinfectant gel jars, like fetuses. A two-bar electric fire on the wall baked the room. 
Desi did his thing amid the cigarette smoke and the hacking coughs. Clippers buzzed between the sound of the snip-snip. No one spoke. In fact, the only word I ever heard Desi say was, Next. Uh, I, uh, I want it short at the back, uh, but, but over the ears and uh, a side parting, I would say. Desi was dressed in blue overalls, pocked with the grease stains of a million dandruff-ridden hairs. He always wore a clean dress shirt and a tightly wound necktie. His own hairstyle was experimental, a great wash of hair curving around the back of his head like a tidal wave. But the most appalling aspect of this barbaric fiend was his attack on children's hair. His face had the calmness of a mannequin and the message in his eyes was as clear as day. I feel nothing. <laughs> so no matter what instructions you gave Desi, all children walked out of his hairy laboratory sporting the German helmet cut circa 1933 to 1945. As I sat being clipped and buzzed back into the Second World War, a low whistle came from Desi's mouth out of tune and dripping with pure menace. <whistles> he was whistling the theme tune to the great escape. Once freed from the chair of torture, I quickly paid and pondered my best route home. A tunnel under the city direct to my house would have been ideal, but there was to be no escaping people's gazes and what I imagined they thought. Desi's made another Nazi. So I slid along the walls of buildings trying to get home unnoticed. I turned my face away from shop windows. On the way, I looked up at the town hall to where the Union Jack the flag of the Queen was flying from the staff. Why was Desi so unpatriotic? Why didn't he cut us all into the shape of a British soldier's helmet? Please take me to the other barber in the main street, I begged my mum when I finally got home. All the other kids are going there now. She was having none of it. Desi's cheap and the ends don't split, she said. But I look like a Nazi, I cried. <laughs> don't be stupid, she said. You don't look anything like a Nazi. I remember the war, don't forget. But I still had school to negotiate and it never went well after a trip to Desi's. Walking through the halls, I was dimly aware of whispered jokes of seek oil from my schoolmates. Even smaller guys tried it on. My anger needed an outlet, and I found it on the soccer field. I hacked the other team with mercilessly high challenges, two-footed assaults that left some in tears, others in wheelchairs. I didn't just leave my foot in tackles, I actually inserted my entire body, including muddy cleats, up the derriers of unsuspecting goalkeepers. I screamed orders, clicked my heels, and stomped on the squishy bits of my generation. Eventually, I'd grow tired, and retreat back to the classroom where I'd subvert the cardinal rule and make threats only to kids I knew I could beat in a fight. Out in the street after school, I would berate dogs, chase cats and laugh at people. It would be years before I learned a word for it, but this was Schadenfreude at its most clinical. It would take several weeks for the German helmet to grow out. In that time, I laughed at crippled people ended the lives of bugs and flies, and was generally out of sorts. It was good training, I suppose, for a season coaching the Dragons. <laughs> I think that's, that's probably enough, eh? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so haircuts.
be afraid of them. Does anybody get any questions or anything? Or? We have a mic done. here too, so if you could speak in the mic so people on YouTube can hear. So how did that battle with the grass work out? Is that uh, still a plot of dead brown mass? It's really bad now. <laughs> it's even worse. That's actually a more serious question. I was wondering um, what your work was like in the San Francisco author scene, uh, like what the local author scene looks like, if you feel like there's something, anything, like a lot of interesting things happening here specifically. Um, I actually live around the corner from the Edinburgh Castle. I know they do readings, but I haven't, still haven't made it around to there yet. So if you could also talk about that program and what you're doing there, I'd be interested. Thank you, yeah. Um, the, the writing scene here is pretty fertile and uh, pretty large and huge. I think the Litquick Festival that I'm involved in every year, there's thousands, that's a thousands, no, hundreds, hundreds of writers read at it, and every year it grows, you know, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's no shortage of uh, writers out here. I think what there is a shortage of is publishing, and uh, publishing is concentrated, you know, on the other side of the country. So, my experience of, you know, a bigger publisher is, uh, has been that it is, you do feel that you're a, a bit of a long distance, you know, it'd be nicer if they were up the street and then you could go down there and uh, annoy them. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, or, or build up a personal friendship or a relationship on a personal basis with your editors or your publicists. So I think publishing is probably something that San Francisco could do with a lot more some good quality publishers. There are good publishers here, don't get me wrong. There are Macadam Cage and there's some good independent publishers also. Manic D Press is really good and some other smaller ones too. So there is a lot of uh, solid people out there who are trying to promote writing. And some people who've gone on to bigger publishers have started out with smaller publishers here and, and, and gone ahead. So yeah, there's lots, everybody's, everybody's writing. Oh, The Castle, yeah. The castle, uh, yeah, it was back in the early 90s. The Edinburgh Castle went bankrupt, you know, in the Tenderloin back in the early 90s. And when we reopened it, we realized that, you know, I'm, I'm the bar manager there. The owners reopened it and they, uh, they realized that they were going to go out of business again unless they used the space for something else instead of just drinking. And so uh, they had a room upstairs and we started putting on all kinds of events there. Anything we could squeeze into a small room, plays, comedy literary events, live music, it all happens up in that small room there at the castle, so. It's, it's, I say that, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I say to writers uh, who are trying to get their work out there, one of the things that really, that I benefited from was having control of the space at the Edinburgh Castle. Because if you can put a platform down, a space, and you can start putting on your own readings and start attracting people to it, you start to raise your visibility. And so, uh, you know, it's one of the things is getting noticed. And the way I got noticed was doing a reading at the Edinburgh Castle by an agent who saw me read. And so, you know, I tell that to people, you know, get out there and if it's spoken word, if it's, uh, you know, any, any pub or any place that's doing an open mic, just go along to it and start reading your stuff out loud, you know, so it's, it's good. We, at the Edinburgh Castle, we have a, an open policy. We encourage, you know, pretty much anyone who's got any literary intent can read there at some point. You know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I have a question about how this book came to be. Uh, you know, of all the experiences you've had, why did this distill itself into a book? Um, I started real as soon as I started coaching. I started realizing that there was this wealth of material that was beginning to sw swim around me and trying to fit in with all the, the parents and negotiating my way through the, the multicultural experience and the, 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 this idea of participation for your kids. And I really wanted to write about it though when the dominant theme emerged with this team we were losing games by scores that required, you know, firemen ladders to reach, you know. You know, those big ladders, the ones that they have to go way up into the stratosphere. That's the kind of results we were getting. You know, 19 nil, you know, 23 nil. <laughs> results like that. And 
when our team came off the field, the parents would say, you guys were great, well done, great, what a game, great, well. And I'm standing around going, it's 23, nothing. <laughs> well done. You know, what kind of reinforcement of loss is that going to be when they grow up? You know, when they go, oh yeah, oh, we lost 230 billion in the stock market. But it doesn't matter, because when I was a kid, I lost 23 nil at soccer and nobody cared. <laughs> Everybody said, well done. I couldn't get around that. Because to me, 23-0 is, you're shite. <laughs> Not you're good, you're shite. And being shy is a good platform to start your, your renaissance from, you know. And so that, to me, I went, wait a minute, I've got to write about this, because this is weird, you know, that whole affirmation of, you know, failure that seems to be going on. I don't get that. That's not where I came from. Where I came from, when you got beat, you know, the coaches were physically, you know, we would be, you know, thrown against a wall by a coach, you know and told, you know, in no uncertain terms that you're not going to humiliate him at the next game by performing like that. So, of course, you can't do that now these days without, you know, going to prison and having social services coming down and taking your children away. So, but the idea of just uh, everything being trophies for losers, you know, I don't, I don't buy into that. I'm not going to. So that gave me kind of the urge to start exploring it, you know, and thinking about the experience. And uh, we had that, that one moment that I was seeking that I realized that we were never going to win and we were never going to get a tie. But I just prayed that we could just get one goal. You know? <laughs> and we got one goal the whole season. <laughs> and when the goal was scored, it was this massive like, rush, you know, almost like, the best ecstasy in the world, you know. <laughs> it was mind blowing, just like, whoa! And it was, it was worth it for that one moment when the kid just scored. Awesome. So it was, it was a good memory, and, and they were all decent kids, you know. That was the thing. As it went along, I was thinking, you all suck, but it was me that sucked, you know. Because I was so petty, and I couldn't understand. And when I was driving home, this is another reason I started writing about it, I was driving home, and my kid was in the back and I'm, and I'm yelling at him and I'm going, why am I acting like this, you know? Why am I all bent out of shape and upset at something so trivial as like a peewee soccer game? And then I noticed that there were all these other parents who were all, you know, you could see they are, you know, inside they wanted some sort of validation that their child could reflect something positive onto them, you know. They wanted that and for our team, it was, they were all just staring at the ground depressed, you know. Like this, but across the way you could see all the other parents, you know, celebrating and being real happy and patting their kids. And you, this was them just, you know, a reflection on how successful they had been as parents. So it was, it was, uh, it was strange. It really unleashed my inner asshole, you know. So, so, so I'm glad I got it out of my system. <laughs> so it's out of your system. There's no intention to relive that moment of ecstasy again. That one goal for next season. Nah, they banned me for life from coaching children, <laughs> man. man. Got my name up on the wall. I wanted for crimes against PV soccer. <laughs> and the coaching job for the Scottish national team hasn't come about because of this book? Well, with my record, I would probably be a candidate for the Scottish national team. <laughs> they probably consider me for the job, yeah. Yeah, they're just about as bad, you know. And getting worse. Are there any other questions? So it sounds like you were kind of do, working on the side as well as writing writing the book. Is that is that right? Yeah, yeah. I have a full time job as a bartender. So how how did you do that? How did you balance that? And, and did you have a schedule, or did you just kind of write? Yeah, it was kind of it was kind of crazy because the the deadline they they sped up the deadline and I had to write the whole thing in six months, and uh, it was pretty strange. I'd come home from the bar and you just my head would just be melted and you know covered in the usual grog stains of the drinking world and sometimes I would just go straight into it and I'd write until the sun came up you know I'd be pretty knackered and exhausted but I think when you're writing and you're in the writing process you know when you're some of the best moments come when you're really burned out you know you're exhausted 
I can see how, you know, people, you know, writers who've got reputations of, like, drinking a lot or, you know, doing a lot of drugs and then, like, writing on it. I'm not that kind of person, not that kind of individual. I don't have that lifestyle, but um, when I was really knackered at 5.30 in the morning, you know, I was like, going, oh, keep going, keep going. Some of my best lines came out, you know. So exhaustion might be a good thing for writers, you know. <laughs> so you get some of, it, some of it out. But yeah, it was pretty, it was, it was pretty hard, but it, was, it, seemed, it seemed hard in a way, but you know, once it was all over, I was quite, quite amazed that it was, I was capable of combining a full-time job and raising two kids and then still being able to write a book in six months. So if I can do it, anyone can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about your swearing festival? Yeah, the swearing festival. Um, well, working in the bar trade, is swearing is everywhere. So, you know, I hear people cursing all the time. And I've always been quite fascinated by swearing. Uh, I'm not somebody who swears a lot in my speech. I, and I, I, I understand swearing as it's a very complex matter. It's, you know, you have have a whole you know, conference of university professors talking about what swearing means and everything from a linguistic point of view. But I had uh, been interested in swearing through its application, through a class filter, I guess. Because when you hear a working class person swearing, there's a perception that that's a threat, you know. You go, oh, that's a threat, they're working class and they're swearing, that means they're gonna come and get me, you know. But if you watch Hugh Grant in Four Weddings and a Funeral, and he's going, oh fuck, oh fuck, you know, oh fuck. It doesn't sound like a threat at all, it sounds like a great line in a movie for a crap actor like him, you know. <laughs> and so he gets, you know, you don't see that as a threat. So I, I started thinking about swear words in their context, and I thought, let's try some experimentation. And we founded, uh, myself and another guy, we, we thought, let's have a swearing festival. And we'll put this together. And uh, we had experiments. Uh, we had a projector and a screen, and we flashed images up in front of the crowd. And it was hugely popular. We had a line, it was the biggest night ever at the Edinburgh Castle. It was a line down the block right, to get in. We thought there might be like 20 people or something. There was like hundreds of people showed up just with this desire to like let go, you know. So we flashed up these images, everything from the usual suspects like Bush and, you know, and then we just put the moon and the Golden Gate Bridge and we asked people to yell out the first swear word that came into their head when they saw these images, you know. And it was bizarre how like people would uh, pause for a moment when they thought, oh no, I can't. There is no swear word that's associated with Martin Luther King. But George Bush, people couldn't get enough of them out of their mouth, you know. <laughs> And so we, we, we kind of played around with uh, these kind of ideas to provoke the audience. And the interesting, uh, there was, we did a lot of other uh, features with people jousting against each other. We had like a, a 30 second uh, worst oath contest where you could get up there and just unload on somebody who you hated. And it was quite dramatic. The woman who won the contest had just gone through this really ugly divorce. And when she did her swearing and her invective against her former husband, it was, uh, it was sad. People were nearly crying, you know, because she kept her voice low. She's going, if I ever see that cunt again, <laughs> I will cut his fucking on You know, and it was so heartfelt, you know, that she'd been abused by this dick, you know. So it was interesting how it was manifesting. People came out, and we did it two years in a row. The first year it was, uh, kind of celebratory, almost fun. People were relaxed and thought it was great. The second year, we changed some of the uh, things around to make it a little more provocative. And sure enough, it became really nasty and hostile and threatening. And the crowd were, were really mean and angry. And it was, it was interesting because it, 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 it it proved to me that swearing is a cul-de-sac, and that's why we're never doing it again, because we'd covered all the bases. 
You go in there, you walk around, you come back out. There's no other place to go because we had gone from swearing as fun and laughing and celebratory to swearing as hostile, aggressive and disturbing. And it makes sense in that way because I think there's been some research recently that swearing is, they think that swear words were some of the first words that human beings used, which makes sense, you know. Somebody, you know, you've got a, a fire going and somebody comes along and goes, hey, can I have some of that? <laughs> no. You're not going to say, well, no, call my lawyer and we'll sort something out. You're just going to say whatever, whatever Stone Age man said, you know, became those words, so. so I guess it's a bit of a survival instinct, yeah. So the swearing festival, fun while it lasted. I don't know. Alan's gonna be staying for uh, some book signing, and thanks again for taking part. And if we wanna keep track of your uh, further writing, where should we go? Uh, alanblack.info. That's my website, and a friend of mine just found a way the other day, he goes, hey, your website, you don't have any of the tags on it, and, and the Google thing, it's way down there, like 10 million places, now he's fixed it for me, it should come to the top in three weeks. That's what he says happens at Google. So thanks so much for having me down here today, it was really cool. Thanks a lot, cheers.